Thank you. You may be seated. This is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. I hope that's your story and your song, that every day you want the day to be filled with praise to our Lord Jesus Christ. Our text this morning is in Exodus chapter 4, verses 6 through 9. We read it just a few moments ago. A message entitled, Leprosy Faith. That sounds like a strange combination, doesn't it? Leprosy, faith, and yet I think we'll see that as we look at the text before us this morning. Last time we saw the immediate preceding verses, verses 1 through 5, where God gives Moses a shock concerning what he's been carrying for who knows how many years, and he never realized how dangerous it was. When you carry a snake, we find God asks him a question not for the purpose of finding out information, because God knows everything. <laughs> he doesn't have to get information from us. But he asked him, what's in your hand? Moses said, a rod, and gave the stupid carnal answer of earth, not realizing what he really had in his hand. It's known as Moses' rod up to this point. After this experience, it's known as the rod of God. God tells him, throw it down. He does, and it becomes a serpent. And then God says to him, Moses, quit running away because Moses had fled from it. Moses looked at it and said, that's a big snake. That's a dangerous snake. I don't like that kind of snake, and I'm out of here. But God told him to stop in his tracks and to grab hold of it by the tail. God graciously let him grab the tail, not the head. And it became a rod again in his hand. And Moses was going to go from that point with that rod in his hand and perform miracles in Egypt. Suddenly it became a sign of power. Suddenly it became a sign of authority. Suddenly it became a, a sign of what God can do with whatever you have in your hand, no matter how worthless, no matter how useless, no matter how little monetary value it has, what God can do when he is in it. Very powerful object lesson for us. You see, Moses had just been arguing with God. And God said, I'm going to let you understand who I am. You've seen the Shekinah glory. You've seen the bush that burns but does not get consumed. You've heard the living God speak to you from heaven. You've heard the God who made everything that there is. And we, we track that back all the way to the Garden of Eden and some seed in the Garden of Eden got planted and grew until the flood and then seeds got carried around and planted in different parts of the earth until finally one of them landed and got planted in what would become the desert and generation after generation of that particular tree grew until there was finally one that dropped a branch or got a branch cut off that became Moses' rod. God had been preparing everything along the way, every little tiny detail, until we have Moses' rod, which God was going to use. Dear people, the very hairs on your head are all numbered. Not a sparrow falls without your father. Do you think it was by accident that Moses picked up the particular stick that became his rod in his wanderings around the desert following sheep? What is it that you have in your hand? It's not there by accident. It's not there because you're so clever. It's not there because you earned it. Whatever you have in your hand was put there by God. And God expects you to take what it is that he's put in your hand and give it to him. Because if you try to keep it for yourself, it's as dangerous as a poisonous snake. And then when you give it to him, sometimes, not always, but sometimes he gives it back to you. And as he gives it back to you, he's in it. And you've learned a lesson. God's going to teach him another lesson in just a moment as we look at our text today. But God always blesses what we give back to him. 
We saw that Moses' arguments fell into two categories, incipient rebellion and two disbelief, saying that God has silly ideas and calling God a liar, which is basically what he was doing when he argued with God. Belief that other people can and always will withstand the sovereign, immutable will of God in the direction of God, he argues and says, but, but they'll never listen to me. They won't. Don't you see God? They, they won't believe me. They won't hearken to my voice, for they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee. They won't believe. They won't listen. I have no current evidence. You know, I can't dig up this bush and carry it with me back to, to Egypt and say, Look at this cool bush that I found, and God talks to me out of this bush. We do the same things with God. We refuse to witness because other people won't believe us. We refuse to tell them the gospel because other people won't listen. We want to argue because there's no current evidence that we can stick in front of them. We don't witness because our experience, because we've seen people who refuse to listen. But believing that people can and will withstand the sovereign will of God and his direction is a false premise. It's always doomed to the trash heap of history. Romans 9.19, Thou wilt say unto me then, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? That whiny tone that those of you who are parents have heard thousands of times from your kids. <laughs> oh, man, I've heard it over and over and over again. You know what happens to kids who do that? <laughs> well, we won't get into that. We'll talk about child discipline at some other point. But things happen to kids who whine and complain like that. And things happen to Moses. He's going to go through it here in just a second. Something that horrifies him, not only scares him, the snake scared him, but something that's going to horrify him. Something's going to make his heart beat faster. Something's going to throw him into a panic. Something that's going to make him feel like the end of the world has just happened. But God asks you the same question. What do you have in your hand? Don't give a stupid answer that's chained to earth. Don't give an answer that comes from the flesh. Don't give an answer that fails to see the infinite possibilities of what God can do with you, his instrument, and through you with the instrument's gifts, talents, money, skills opportunities, time and history, key positions in his plan and by his power. Moses had a rod in his hand. God has you in his hand. You are his rod. And when you begin to understand that, that the power of God moving in you and through you because you are indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God can accomplish the infinite because God is in it, not your flesh. You can't do anything. But God can use you to accomplish something that is beyond Moses' rod. He's given you his word, and as you share it with someone, the Spirit of God transforms a dead man into a living man, a dead woman into a living woman, a dead boy or girl into a living boy or girl. Something happens where someone is spiritually born again when you take the word of God, for this is what is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Will you be his instrument? And will you take what's in your hand and use it for him instead of for yourself. That brings us to leprosy faith, verses 6 through 9. The Lord said, Furthermore unto him, Put now thine hand into thy bosom. And he put his hand into his bosom, and he took it out, and behold, his hand was leprous as snow. Now before we actually look at that, I want to look at something else that just jumps out at you. I hope it jumps out at you. In the context of this passage, the first thing we notice in the general context is that God has certain principles that he has established for the verification of truth. For the verification of truth. Even before giving the law. This is before the law. But God has set in motion certain things so that we'll know what's true and what is false. And one of those is the principle of two or three witnesses. 
In the law, we have it defined for us in Deuteronomy chapter 17, verses 5 and following. Then shalt thou bring forth that man or that woman which have committed that wicked thing unto thy gates, even that man or that woman, and shall stone them with stones till they die. At the mouth of two or three witnesses shall he that is worthy of death be put to death. But at the mouth of one witness, he shall not be put to death. The hands of the witnesses, important. The hands of the witnesses shall be first upon him to put him to death, and afterward the hands of all the people, so shalt thou put away evil from among you. Two chapters later, in chapter 19, verse 15, One witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or for any sin, in any sin that he sinneth, at the mouth of two witnesses, or at the mouth of three witnesses, shall the matter be established. God is giving to Moses three witnesses, which we'll look at in our text. You know, the Lord Jesus Christ, when he came into the world, God gave at least ten witnesses, or groups of witnesses, concerning his person and his work. At least seven of those are listed for us in the Gospel of John, but others are listed in the other Gospels as well. The first witness is John the Baptist, John 1, 7. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. The works of Christ were given for a witness, John 5, 36 and 10, 25. But I have greater witness than that of John. For the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do bear witness of me that the Father hath sent me. And 10.25, Jesus answered them, I told you, and ye believed not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. The Father himself bore witness of Christ. Of course, if you're aware very much of the baptism of Christ, the voice coming from heaven, and the voice coming from heaven at the transfiguration in Matthew chapter 17, but the Lord Jesus Christ states it himself in John 5.37, And the Father himself which hath sent me hath borne witness of me, ye have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his shape, but the Father has borne witness of me. Jesus himself bore witness, John 8:18. 8, I am one that bear witness of myself, and the Father that sent me beareth witness of me. The disciples, there are 12 of them, so we could count a lot more, but in terms of groups or individuals, the different ones that we find, there are at least 10 in the Gospels, and seven of them in the Gospel of John. John 15, 27, And ye also shall bear witness, because ye have been with me from the beginning. The Scriptures bear witness to Christ. John chapter 5, verse 39, Search the Scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. You're beginning to get the idea, God only requires for us two or three witnesses. But when God sends His Son, He gives us so many witnesses, how can we resist it? The Holy Spirit, John 15, 26. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. He'll bear witness concerning me. The Holy Spirit always points to Jesus. He doesn't point to himself. The charismatic movement is wrong on this point because they spend all their time talking about the Holy Spirit and pointing to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit always points to Christ. How important that is so that we do not get a lopsided theology. Jesus must be the center of our theology and of our practice. The angels and demons also testify concerning him. Oh, you know the beautiful pictures of the angels. The first place that we find his annunciation of the birth of Christ by the angels to the shepherds in Luke chapter 2, verses 8 and following, there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. The angels announced who? He was. John 1 51, Jesus speaking. And he saith unto them, unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see heaven opened, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. It takes place in Matthew chapter 17. 
the transfiguration, and there we find two more witnesses, Moses and Elijah, talking with him on the Mount of Transfiguration. But he talks about the angels ascending and descending. He's bringing us back to a picture of Jacob's ladder in the Old Testament, where the Shekinah glory appears to Jacob in Bethel as he is resting there, and then he sets up that stone and calls it the house of God, which is what Bethel means. The angels ascending and descending but there they're going up to God and coming back down to earth. He says, now you're going to see them ascending and descending on the Son of Man. The one who has come down from the throne room of heaven and is now here on earth. The angels bear witness as to who Jesus is. At his resurrection, the angels bore witness. Matthew 28, And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning, his raiment white as snow, and for fear of him the keepers did shake and became as dead men. The angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead and behold he goeth before you into Galilee there shall you see him lo I have told you the angels bore witness to Jesus and they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy and did run to bring the disciples word John mentions it in John chapter 20, verse 12, and see two angels in white sitting, the one on the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. Luke chapter 24, we find it now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning. They came unto the sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher, and they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. And it came to pass, as they were much perplexed thereabout, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. The angels testified and reminded them of what Jesus had said. Angels point to Jesus, not to themselves. But then the demons, Behold, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? Art thou come hither to torment us before the time? They call him the Son of God. Mark chapter 1, 24, saying, Let us alone! What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. Mark chapter 5, verse 7, And cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. Luke 4.34, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. Luke 8.28, When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I beseech thee, torment me not. Do you get the idea that God has given us witnesses concerning who Jesus is and what he has done? People, when I was preparing this message, I wept. I thought, this is the Christ whom I love. This is the Christ whom I serve. We have the truth. What are we doing with it? What is it that you have in your hand? Do you understand its power? You say, uh, duh, I got a Bible in my hand. Like Moses, tied to earth, stupid answer. Duh, I've got a rod. Do you understand the power of God that you have in your hand? God has established principles by which we are to live. 
And he himself follows those principles as we see in our text today. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established if that's the case. How about in the mouth of all those dozens of witnesses? Fall into many different categories. Some individuals, some groups. But they all point to Jesus, who he is and what he has done. That two or three witness principle was established by Jesus in the Gospels, Matthew 18, 16. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. It's required of the church in this age, 2 Corinthians 13, 1. This is the third time I'm coming unto you. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. 1 Timothy 5.19 Against an elder receive not an accusation but before two or three witnesses. Hebrews 10.28 and following He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sorer punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the spirit of grace. For we know him that hath said vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, saith the Lord, and again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Moses was learning that at the burning bush. And he wasn't dealing with a local tribal God. He wasn't dealing with a God with whom he could argue. He wasn't dealing with a God who is incapient, incapable or incompetent. He was dealing with a God of heaven and earth. We find that God still uses that principle even during the tribulation. Revelation chapter 11, verse 3, And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand and two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. Now, I've spent some time on that because I want you to see what's happening in the text in front of us today. God gave Moses three witnesses as proof of the veracity of Moses' testimony, and they are witnesses before God sent his judgment. Before God sent the ten plagues of Egypt, one of them foreshadows those plagues. Oh, that third witness does. But it's very little. Did you notice those three witnesses? The first witness was the rod that became a serpent and then turned back into a rod. We talked about that last week. The second witness was the leprous hand that then became whole again. The third witness in our text is the pitcher of water that he dips into the river and when he pours it out it becomes blood. It doesn't say red like blood. It became blood. It wouldn't impress the Egyptians at all if he put water into the pitcher and poured it out and it was just red like blood and they looked at it, smelled it, sniffed it, tasted it. It wasn't blood. It was blood! That foreshadows, of course, turning all the water in Egypt to blood. God gave them fair warning, gave them three shots across the bow of their ship. And God gave it to Moses so that Moses would quit arguing with God. Now God has given us more witnesses than that because he's given us the word of God. And he's given us the indwelling Holy Spirit of God. And he's given us other people around us who know Christ and who are willing to die for Christ. We have the witnesses we need to get us moving with the job God gave us to do. You shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. We've got the witnesses. And we are to be among them. Oh, people, I love you, but we've got to reach the lost for Christ. This, this is a community filled with lost people. Around you, your neighbors are lost people. What are you doing with what's in your hand? Next thing to notice here in the text is notice how God focuses on Moses' hand again. The first time was what's in your hand. Cast it down, pick it up with your hand. But now he focuses on his hand again in verse 6. And the Lord said furthermore unto him, Put now 
thine hand into thy bosom. And he put his hand into his bosom. And when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous as snow. Rather interesting when you contrast the two words that are used. The first time he just sort of sticks it in and he sort of nonchalantly pulls it out. And then he's shocked with it. The second time he puts it in quickly and he jerks it out. Read your text. <laughs> Rather interesting to see that. God wanted to make sure that Moses understood something here, I think. That there was no magic in his hand that did the rod to snake miracle. God can corrupt, God can defile, God can destroy, God can take away whatever gift he has given to us just as surely as he can give the gift. Remember that. It's not yours. It's his. Leprosy was just as deadly as the serpent, of course. It just took a little bit longer to kill you while it rotted your body off. One piece at a time. It rot your fingers off. Then it rot your toes off. Then it would rot your nose off. Then it would rot your lips off. Then it would get farther than your toes. It would rot your feet off and your legs off and your hands off and your arms off and your skin off. It made you grotesquely ugly. They call it Hansen's disease today. There are still places in the world where it is prevalent. I read some time ago about a man, not a Christian, but uh, who wrote of an experience. And he was in India. And uh, he saw a woman across the river coming down to bathe. And he suddenly decided to throw all of his faithfulness to his wife away. And so he was going to go over and take this native woman. And he plunged into the water and he swam across the river. And as he surfaced near her, thinking he would have fleshy pleasure. He looked at her and saw that she was a leper. And her body was covered with leprosy sores and disfigured face and hands. And of course his conscience smote him. Dear people, and he did not. Dear people, Sin is like leprosy. It defiles, it destroys, it corrupts. It rots us away from the inside. It makes you ugly. And remember, God is not only able to heal, but God can kill you through the most terrifying and crippling diseases. God wants his people to learn to fear the Lord. Proverbs tells us the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's not the end of wisdom. But you'd better start there with the fear of the Lord. And God is teaching that lesson to Moses. Leprosy in the Bible. We won't have time to cover everything, but let me give you at least a few of the things that leprosy in the Bible, what the Bible says about it. Number one was leprosy was humanly incurable. Humanly incurable. Leprosy was a picture and a type of sin. Just like your sin is humanly incurable, leprosy rots you one piece at a time. You may start out, you think, gorgeous and beautiful, but you know, you can really tell the difference between an old person who has given their life to Christ and an old person who has given their life to sin. I've been in ministry over 40 years at this point. And you know when you're around certain people, it doesn't matter how old and wrinkled they are, they radiate Christ. Maureen Gordon was like that. Even at 102 or 103, whatever it was, when she finally passed away, you go into her presence, she was totally blind. She was wrinkled. She was old. She was infirm. But she radiated Christ. She was so beautiful. Yet I've dealt with other old people who are hardened, cynical, 
you can tell they are lying to you through their teeth. And their features show it. They radiate nothing but selfishness and ugly sin. That's why leprosy is used as a picture and a type of sin in Scripture. Only God could heal the leper. And that tells us something about Jesus because Jesus healed lepers. Jesus is God. A leper was required to cover his mouth and his beard to keep others from being defiled. Jesus told us, it's not what goes into the man that defiles him, but what comes out of the man that defiles him. Because it comes from his heart. And so a leper was required to cover his mouth because it was a picture of the stuff that comes out from inside us, which is the wicked filth of sin. A leper was required to cry out, Unclean! Unclean! So that others could keep away and protect themselves. Sin announces us to the world around us. And it most clearly announces us in the presence of God. We are unclean. We're unclean like a filthy rag, and our iniquities have taken us away like the wind, says the prophet Isaiah. A leper was not allowed to come into the presence of God to worship, just like sin keeps us from his presence until the leper was to be declared clean. And then he could come into worship. First at the tabernacle, then at the temple. A leper could not come into fellowship with those who were clean, even his own family. He was separated from them, those who were clean. He was separated from the clean ones, and he himself could not come in contact with them. A leper could not participate in the covenant blessings of the people of God, but he had to dwell outside the camp. Oh, that, a great deal is made of that in the Old Testament. But you know, the New Testament tells us that Christ went outside the camp for us. When he bore our sins, when he identified with us, when he touched the lepers to make them well, that's what he did for us spiritually. He went outside the camp. When a leper was cleansed, he was required to bring specific sacrifices and if you look at those sacrifices, you discover they are typical. That is, they are types and pictures of our Lord Jesus Christ. Houses and buildings could be declared unclean with leprosy. And there are all kinds of rules related to that to determine whether or not it's a spreading leprosy, a fretting leprosy, and all kinds of things like that in a building. And if it was a certain type of leprosy, you couldn't just cleanse it. You couldn't just scrape it. You had to tear it down and carry it stone by stone into an unclean place. You lost your house. You lost your store. You lost your building. I think that gives us some pictures also. There may be certain places that are sinful and unclean for Christians to go. You know what they're like. You know where you ought not to be found. You know where you would bear a bad testimony for the Lord Jesus Christ. You know the places that are unclean, where you are tempted to sin. Did you know that clothing and fabric could be considered unclean with leprosy? There are certain types of clothing that are unclean for a Christian to wear. Things that reveal you in an immodest way, things that identify with a worldly culture and place you squarely into it, Certain shirts and t-shirts that have slogans on them that no Christian ought to ever be wearing. God gave us the Old Testament as pictures and types to teach us spiritual lessons. He taught them to little babies, so to speak, to Israel in the Old Testament. But we now have the indwelling Holy Spirit. We now have the finished work of Christ on the cross. We now have the completion of the sacrifices. We now have the completion of all the types and pictures in the tabernacle in Christ. We now have a picture fulfilled in Christ that is supposed to teach us how we are supposed to not just believe, but how we are supposed to live. Leprosy. Four minutes. We'll jump down to leprosy faith. 
We find Moses here exercising what we could call leprosy faith, doing what God commands and for what he has provided to be clean. Verse 7, it says, And he said, Put thine hand into thy bosom again. And he put his hand into his bosom again. It doesn't say he drew it out, it just took it out. It says, And he plucked it out of his bosom. He stuck it in and, and he... Oh! You see, Moses understood leprosy. Moses knew that when that happened to his hand, suddenly he was a dead man on the installment plan. Where he wanted to see what God was going to do. He jerked it out. Dear people, the people around us have leprosy. They're dying on an installment plan. And someday they will be cast into the lake of fire. They're outside the camp. They're bearing their sins. They are unclean. And they do not know that there has come one who will go outside the camp to them and who will touch a leper and who will make him clean. Ye are my witnesses. God never leaves himself without a witness. And you are it. Have you carried the good news recently? Have you reached out to a leper recently? What are you doing with what's in your hand? And plucked it out of his bosom, and behold, it was turned again as his other flesh. Moses was scared with that first one, with that snake, and he ran away from it. But you can't run away from leprosy. Moses was terrified with the leprosy because it meant he was a dead man. And only God could heal him. Miriam's going to have to learn this lesson a little bit later in the book of Exodus. We'll get to her when we get to it. She's going to have to learn the same lesson that Moses learns here. But Moses is the man God has chosen to go to Pharaoh and he says, I'm going to give you some signs that they will believe and if they won't, I'll give you a third sign and if they don't, judgment is coming. Dear people, judgment's coming to our country. We are the witnesses God has put in the United States. We are to carry the message to the Pharaohs of our country that they might hear and believe, or if it be the will of God, that they would be hardened, whether they harden their own hearts or God hardens their hearts. Both are said in Scripture. That then the judgment will be just. What are you doing, not only with what's in your hand, but what are you doing with your hand? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power. Magnificent word! You have magnified your word above all your name. What do we have in our hand? Do we understand your power to heal the leprosy of sin? Does it make us bold to go to those who are lost and headed for hell? Father, we pray that you'll take your word and use it in our hearts to the glory of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is hymn number 574, A Child of the King.